there, financial warriors. Welcome to another exciting episode of Money 911, where we transform financial emergencies into financial opportunities. I'm Chris Miller, your guide on this journey of wealth building and financial freedom. Today's episode is nothing short of inspiring. Imagine turning a single family home into a revenue generating machine that doubles or even triples your rental income. Sounds intriguing, right? Our guest today did precisely that and more. For overcoming personal and family struggles and becoming a millionaire by age 28 and retiring by 31. This journey is filled with actionable insights and transformational stories. Let's dive into how you can harness the power of student housing to skyrocket your financial growth. All right, Ryan, it's a pleasure and honor to have you here today. Thank you. And thanks for inviting me on the show. Absolutely. Well, I wanted to share with everybody because we talk about healthy money and and ways to grow it, protect it and and help other people. And you have such a great, unique model here, very creative. Maybe you could share a little bit about your grandfather's experience and how it's shaped your approach in the real estate investing. Yeah, so I'm a pharmacist turned real estate investor, and I got inspired by my grandpa who invested in a couple big, um, properties in the San Francisco Bay Area back in the 1950s when they were like dirt cheap. And, you know, not only that the houses appreciated over time like crazy, but the rental income went up and was able to support not only him, but he was able to use some of that money to support my uh, education, college education, as well as some of my brother's college education as well. So I realized that real estate is one of the best ways to create generational wealth uh, for your family and for your loved ones. So I wanted to get started as soon as possible. In 2016, I got my doctorate of pharmacy and I started working as a pharmacist in uh, retail stores like Rite Aid. And I started also working at um, the hospital pharmacy as well. So inpatient pharmacy. So I worked two jobs and I was working a lot of overtime. Um, I would typically actually get in at 7.30 a.m. And then I would work until 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. at night. So um, I just worked a lot of hours and tried to save up as much capital as possible so that I can get into real estate. So I basically bought my first property in 2016. It was a $262,000 property. And what I did that was unique was that I rented it out by the bedroom to college students. And each college student, I'll charge around $600 to $700 per room. And usually I'll get a house to about six bedrooms. So that will lead to about $3,600 to $4,200 per month in rental income total. That is so creative. And, and I can relate. Um, I totally understand the real estate. My, my daddy, he bought a piece of property over there in Portola Valley before the uh, big boom hit, hit Silicon Valley. So oh, the wow. property, yeah. right? He bought it at 15,000, built his own house on there. And then um, he actually sold it before the, this, the big boom came. But the actual location is probably worth 15 million right now. So, wow, that's crazy. I know, I know. And it's so beautiful with deers and pine trees. So, But real estate is really... It's always good to have real estate in your portfolio. And that is such a cool, creative way to multi-purpose the house, you know, and, and make it useful for lots of people. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, definitely. It saves them a lot of money as well because, you know, they're paying $600 for a room versus staying on campus. Uh, it's like $1,200 a month, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. It was When some of the... I'm sure when you first started, what were some of the challenges that you faced when you was investing in real estate? Here, you're the doctor of pharmacy, and now you're checking out real estate, right? Yeah, exactly. I didn't really have any mentors when I got started, so I just 
bought a property and then just rolled with the punches. And a lot of problems happened on my very first property because I bought a house that was 100 years old. It was over 100 years old, actually. And I had a lot of things that came up, like the sewage line broke mm -hmm. on me and it cost me like $9,000 to replace the whole line with PVC pipe. And then I had uh, HVAC that I had to put in during the summertime because the uh, summer got up to like 100, 100 degrees, like 110 degrees, actually. And the tenants were like, there's no AC. And so I was like, oh, shoot, I didn't really check for that when I bought the house. Um, but yeah, the house didn't have any AC. It just had fans, right? Mm -hmm. So I had to pay $15,000 to install an HVAC into the house. And so I just had all these things stack up and I lost over about $35,000, I would say, on that first house. Um, and then I learned, of, of course, a lot of lessons from that, that I can do my due diligence uh, during that inspection period to find out all these things ahead of time so that I look out for how old is the roof? How old is the HVAC? Do we even have a AC um, present? How old is the sewage line? That type of stuff, right? So... I do that all during the inspection period now so that I avoid problems later. And that first house, even though I lost $35,000 at the beginning, I bought it for $262,000 and I recently sold it for $437,500. So go. real estate is a very forgiving game, even if you lose money at the beginning because of the appreciation on land value, land always goes up. People always need a roof over their, over their head. People always need a place to stay. Uh, real estate always appreciates very well, especially if you're in, you know, cities like California and, right. and great, you know, cities yeah. that are thriving and growing. Yeah, it's definitely overappreciated now, but and right. I don't really know what the percentage is long haul, but it's it is always going up. That is for sure. So yeah, it's in between like three to seven percent. For it's most three to seven. Years. Okay, depending. Yeah, depending. What, on you know where we're at, right? Maybe walk us walk us through the process of identifying a profitable neighborhood for student rentals. Yeah, so student rentals is very specific, right? It's a very niche market. So what I want to be. Uh, doing is I look for the top colleges. So I go to the US News top colleges list, and I'll look through the colleges on there. And these are colleges that accept students that are well rounded, they're usually looking for some professional degree, like a doctorate of pharmacy, dentistry, uh, medical degree, nursing, uh, I have like law degree students, I have engineering students. And so most of these students, they're really focused on their studies. And they're not there to throw a wild frat party or something like that, they're really, you know, trying to get their doctorate. And most of the students I get are actually graduate students because the colleges, they provide enough housing for undergrads, but they usually don't provide enough housing for grad students. And so there will be like 3000 grad students that are, just don't have any housing because they're not allowed to stay on campus because the on campus doesn't have a building for them. They only have it for undergrads. Um, so I rent out to a lot of these grad students and I'll also rent out to medical professionals like um, healthcare workers, like uh, residents and fellows um, and nurses, etc. And so I typically want to be nearby both a top college as well as a top hospital or, or a hospital that has at least 400 beds or more because those are larger hospitals and they employ a lot of people. Um, so that's the first thing I look out for. Then I want to be figuring out how close am I going to be to the school. So I look for houses that are within usually a walking distance to campus, but if not a walking distance, at least a five minute drive to campus or less. Um, and, you know, same thing for the hospital, relatively close to the hospital as well. Um, and then finally, I look for uh, what are the neighborhoods that are safe in that area? A lot of times I'll go to Reddit and I'll go to look up off-campus housing and see what the uh, graduate students are talking about because I want to try to get into, you know, the, the student's head and figure out, okay, what are the areas that they feel safe staying in? And they'll mention like buzzwords like, I want to stay in Little Italy or I recommend you stay in Little Italy. And so that's where I'll buy my houses, right? Um, and then finally, the last thing is uh, you want to make sure that the house has a large enough size so you can add extra bedrooms. So typically, I want to have at least 1,500 square foot or more because I want to get six 
six people in there, five or six people. And there's a rule. I, I mean, it's kind of a rule I, I made, but you divide the square footage by 300 and that's how many bedrooms you can have at a house potentially. So if it's 1500 square foot divided by 300, that's five bedrooms. If it's 1800 square foot divided by 300, that's six bedrooms. And I really try to get to the six bedrooms because again, 600 per room times six is 3,600 to $4,200 if you're charging $700 per room per month. Interesting. So, okay. So how do you find those right people? Like, um, are traveling nurses or the students? How do you find those people? Yeah, that's a great question. So I really like using Facebook housing groups. There's usually specific Facebook groups that have like college student housing um, or just general city housing groups. So like uh, Sacramento housing or, you know, we have a school called Sacramento State in Sacramento. And so I'll go into the Sacramento State housing groups or Sacramento State off campus housing, that type of thing. Um, other places I look is uh, there's a lot of sites out there. There's like apartments.com. There's Uloop. Uh, university loop, which is basically just for the universities. And there's also affiliate sites as well, where the college will have their own site for off campus listings. And then you coordinate with the college to get your um, room listed on that site as well. Um, so yeah, those are just a few areas. Obviously, there's a lot of housing sites out there. Um, so I post everywhere. Uh, Roomies.com is another one Roomies.com. Um, and I just post everywhere. And I, you know, we get a lot of students and I have about 90 tenants now. Awesome. So are you focusing more on students than, say, traveling nurses or doctors? Yeah, mainly, okay, well, mainly graduate students, but I do have a lot of residents and fellows. I probably have at least 30% of my uh, population that are medical professionals in some sense. That you know, an intern, a medical intern, or a resident, or a fellow, or a nurse. That's really interesting. Um, I I inherited a, a little villa in Little Italy. Imagine that in in San oh, that's funny. Yeah, in San Diego. Right? Nice. Yeah, that's beautiful. great area. Yeah, and my gut says don't sell. Right, mm -hmm. and it was like okay, just you know rent out for a couple months. And then I started getting the sure. emails from traveling nurses, and I haven't done it yet. Um, right, right. I'm just. You know, it's just, it's kind of a new thing for me to even think into that. Sure. But, yeah. you know, but it's a nice way to keep the mortgage paid and keep the property. It's just like, you know, when you have these people coming in, how do you vet them out? How do you know they're not going to, you know, dirty the carpet and then go through this stuff, right? Oh, well, yeah, sure. And so part of that is having the right management team as well. Management. So you want to have a good set of cleaners um, in case, you know, they're not keeping uh, the house clean. Uh, but generally speaking, I would say graduate students are pretty clean. Um, residents and fellows are pretty clean. Uh, but just in case you want to have a cleaner team nearby. And what I use is like Airbnb cleaners. Um, I found them on, I believe the site is called Turno, T-U-R-N-O. And they usually will clean, like we can get a whole house cleaning for $180, which wow. is pretty good. Yeah, yeah definitely. Mm -hmm. Especially in California, right? Yeah. What kind of what advice would you give someone that's looking to start their journey and and they're investing by balancing, you know, busy, demanding career like you just did with, you know. Oh, yeah. So I worked as a pharmacist for eight years uh, from 2016 till I graduated, basically. Uh, or sorry, I graduated. I left my job. I retired from pharmacy last year, August of 2023. Um, so, yeah, about seven and a half to eight years or so. And um I basically, you know, I obviously you, you're going to need a lot of capital. So if you can work hard at the beginning just to save up that money um, and then after the third year or so, you can start taking out equity from the property to expand and then you don't have to use as much of your own money. You can take out something like a HELOC, a home equity line of credit, and maybe you take out $30,000 from there and then you use $30,000 from your savings. Well, that's another down payment on a house potentially depending on what city you're in, obviously. Um, so I basically, you know, worked really hard. Um, like I said, I worked these double shifts, which means 7.30 a.m. to 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. And I just tried to 
you know, buy as many houses as I could. I, I basically bought one a year, though, because that was, that was the fastest that I could reasonably go at the beginning. Um, and then once you achieve a certain scale, again, you can tap into equity and expand further if you'd like. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's the time management is a key piece. And so I put in a lot of these processes and uh, programs and systems. And now I have a virtual assistance team as well that helps me with the property. And so having the right team and having the right you know, systems and processes. I know everyone probably says that, but it, it really is so important um, to establish that if you want to create a business, right? A true business. Right. That right. And what are HELOCs are like 6% or something now? Oh, no, they're pretty high now. I think they're like 8 to 8 percent to 9 percent okay. yeah 8.75 yeah. or 8 to 8.75 so there's a little um, money lost there in a sense right <clears throat> yeah so you only pay for like what you take out so like let's say you take let's say you get approved for a two hundred thousand dollar heloc or something well okay. if you keep it at zero you pay zero interest on zero dollars right so you can keep it at zero until you actually need it and when you need it you can take out like i said maybe thirty thousand from there and you can take thirty thousand from your savings to buy a house, and so the payment on the thirty thousand dollar, like if it's eight percent, that's twenty four hundred a year, which is about two hundred dollars a month. So if your um, rental can pay that and have cash flow on top of it, then it makes sense usually to do that to expand. And a lot of HELOCs will also have a cap on it as well. Right. Um, but the good news is that the Fed seems to be decreasing interest rates, so the the HELOC rates will probably float down actually in the near future hopefully we'll see we'll um see. Yeah. yeah we'll see we'll right. see but um right. yeah i think it does make sense um especially for this model if we're you know making forty two hundred dollars in rental income and the mortgage payment on these properties are usually around anywhere from fifteen hundred dollars a month to two thousand dollars a month you're still having like two thousand uh, well anywhere from like i would say fifteen hundred dollars a month to two thousand a month in net cash flow after all expenses are paid after you know cleaning fees uh landscaping etc right right so do you think your your experience as a pharmacist influenced your approach to real estate investing yeah so pharmacy and real estate are very different uh but the one commonality in them is they're both service-based businesses right at the end of the day it's about you taking care of the customer. So if the tenants are unhappy, you're not providing a good living environment, then that falls on you, right, as a responsibility. And so I think that's what pharmacy taught me is how to, you know, take responsibility, um, put, you know, constantly improve my services, uh, constantly try to get better every day, you know, every month, whatever. Um, and so I think that kind of translated into me being a you know, uh, I, I would like to think I'm a, a pretty good landlord, I would say, because I, you know, I do provide as much as I can for them. Uh, I even allow them like to, I, I buy like electric scooters if they need help transporting uh, nice. to the college, um, you know, yeah. borrow it for free and any, anything, any furniture you need for free. Um, and then obviously I have a really good cleaning team now. So if the house does get dirty, I just go ahead and send them in. And so there's like, you know, a lot of things that I try to do to really make that experience special so that they want to not only stay themselves, but invite their friends as well. So all of these people, they have like five or six friends. And so what happens is the following year, if some people move out, they'll say, oh, I, I know this John is moving out. Can I bring in my three other um, friends who are, you know, in the same program as me? They're all doctors or, you know, uh, medical interns or whatever. And, you know, I, I'd love for to bring them into the house. And so, you know, if you take care of your tenants, the tenants will take care of you back. That's right. That is absolutely right. Well, now tell me maybe just what kind of common pitfalls would you tell someone to avoid when, when they're starting out with a room rental? Yeah, there's definitely a lot of random things that can happen at a house like water leaks for example we all know those can be pretty bad um sewage leaks um or sewage pipes breaking or roots getting stuck into the sewage pipes um so there's like a lot of little red flags that you can find when the home inspection report comes back now unfortunately the home inspector doesn't always catch everything and sometimes things like water leaks they don't they're not bad until they occur right you, you can't like 
knock down the wall and look at all the pipes. That's just impractical, right? So there's always going to be a certain amount of uncertainty in real estate. And that's why um, what I do is I use this student rental model where I rent by the bedroom so that I have a lot, sorry, so that I have enough cash flow to cover when I do get a water leak or something that's going to cost me a couple thousand dollars. Instead of costing me like years worth of rent, um, or cash flow, it only costs me, you know, a couple of months, a few months of cash flow if I have to replace like, um, I don't know, some water pipes, a sewage line or water heater, whatever. Right. So it's really important you have that cash flow as a cushion so that when these unexpected events occur that are kind of unpredictable, sometimes um, you have the cash available for that. Absolutely. I used to tell people, you know, six month rainy day. Now I say one or two years rainy day. Because That's good to have. Exactly. Right. There's a lot of vulnerability in the planet right now. So. Mm -hmm. Maybe share a success story from someone you've mentored using your system. Sure. Yeah, I have this uh, me uh, mentee. Her name is Sydney. Uh, she bought in North Carolina. And the properties in that area were around low 300,000. And the first property, she actually bought it, it as a four bed, two bath. And she got it to, um, I think, seven beds, two baths. And she had seven people rented out uh, unfurnished. Uh, for about forty two hundred or a little bit over forty two hundred dollars a month, and so uh, the mortgage on that thing was only like fifteen hundred dollars though. So her cash flow was, um, you know, over two thousand dollars. So it was it was a good first start. And then she, yeah. um, because it was so successful, she bought two others in that area, and she just made her offer on the fourth one. Um, so. Yeah. And then her yeah. other three rentals are rented out and everything. So it's great. It's a very good strategy. Um, there's always new incoming tenants every year. I mean, my alma mater has been around since like 1858 or something like this. So, you know, colleges are always going to be there. You always know they're going to have fresh students. Um, as long as, you know, our birth rates are there, we'll continually have students, right? Go through college. Right. There's plenty, right? Um, yeah. So, yeah. Well, what could... Maybe that would really be good. Tell the listeners today, what kind of steps can they take towards financial independence through real estate investment? Yeah, I think the most important thing is you get something as soon as you can. Just get the first house. Just focus on that first one. Because once you get the first one, you're in the game. Because that first one will appreciate along with the other houses in the area. And that gives you more opportunity um, in the future if you want to sell it, if you want to cash out, refinance it, or do a HELOC on it, it allows you to purchase more and more. So like, for example, when I bought my first property in 2016, I bought it for $262,000 in Stockton, California. And I thought that was a lot of money at the time. I was looking at the other houses. And I was like, this is expensive, right? I was looking at all the houses in the area. I was like, this is super expensive. But now, you know, if you ask me now, hey, 262,000, everyone's going to say, oh, that's super cheap. And back then I was thinking this is overpriced, you know? Right. Um, so the, the interesting thing about real estate is looking back, you realize everything was so cheap 10 years ago, but it, it's the same thing now. Right now we feel like it's super expensive, but in 10 years, you're going to look back and say, hey, that five hundred thousand dollar house that's that's cheap that was cheap back then because back of inflation then, right? right because right. of inflation appreciation etc right. so real estate is one of the best ways to build and maintain wealth and preserve your wealth just because it keeps up with everything it keeps up with inflation um a lot of, if you're in a good city it surpasses inflation and you're also using leverage you're only putting 20 percent down so like let's say your house goes up 20% and you put a 20% down, well, then you just doubled your money. Right. 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 Yeah. Absolutely. So that's the great part about real estate. Right. And I'm sure you have everything in your living trust, right? All your real estate. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So a, doing the, yeah, yeah. Right. The living I had trust. a client, he had $44 million in real estate and didn't uh -huh. have a living trust. Right? Oh no, that's really scary. <laughs> the but, government's you know, going to get like 25% of that or whatever. At probably. least, at yeah, least. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, yeah. So it's called a, it's called an irrevoc oh, sorry, a revocable trust, right? A, a revocable, revocable living, living, trust, living trust. Right. Right. Yeah. And then if you get over, well, they keep changing the laws, but you know, 11 point something, and then it, it'll change because all the old tax laws are coming back. They'll probably lower it to a million where you where you have 
you can use different other trusts to mitigate different tax issues and things. But yeah, yeah. Advanced exactly. planning. But on well, tell everybody how they can get you're a mentor, you help people. If there's someone out there that, you know, wants to learn what you do, tell them how to get in contact with you. Yeah, of course. So I've taught this strategy, the student housing strategy, uh, to 60 other clients so far over the last like four years or so. Um, I've been doing student housing for about eight years. And so I actually go through in my free PDF guide how I got started and some of the strategies I used and specific mistakes that I made that I learned from and what to do, not how to avoid that mistake in the future. And that free PDF is at www.newbierealestateinvesting.com slash guide. That's www.newbierealestateinvesting.com slash guide. And newbie is spelled N-E-W-B-I-E. And uh, when you sign up, you also get some mails for emails from me, uh, which basically goes through a lot of um, the tact, not just the strategies I use, but some of the mindset um, behind being a, a good, you know, a professional real estate investor. And a lot of the, the things I'm learning along my journey that I think can help people. Well, I'm curious, what age was it that you retired? Uh, 31. 31. Oh, yeah, last well, year. Congratulations. That's, that's, that's inspiring, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, know. you. It's it's semi retirement though because no, I, I you no. know obviously I I work on training my leader my uh, VA virtual assistant team and then I also um you know teach others how to do real estate but yeah I mean yeah. it's yeah, you're working retired the pharmacy uh, income was replaced so exactly yeah. mm -hmm. exactly well Ryan it's been a joy talking to you and and an inspiration to show people there's a very creative way to create income. You'll never outlive and have fun while you're doing it. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks again for the invitation, Chris. All right. Thank you for tuning into Money 911. We hope today's conversation has sparked new ideas and confidence in you to take that next big step towards financial independence. Remember, financial freedom starts with smart strategies and persistent action. Our guest today has shown just how transformational real estate can be even with a busy career and hurdles along the way. If you found value in this episode, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and leave us a review. Stay inspired, stay proactive, and take charge of your financial future. Until next time, keep thriving and transforming your financial reality. There's so much to learn about healthy money. I hope today's discussion brings you one step closer to securing and protecting your future. So you can get started on the right foot, go to meetwithchrismeller.com and schedule your free financial fitness strategy session. Thank you for listening and please subscribe to Money 911 so you don't miss our next episode, which includes health, wealth, and peace of mind.